The opinions and viewpoints expressed in .NET Rocks are not necessarily those of its sponsors or of Microsoft Corporation, its partners, or employees. .NET Rocks is a production of Franklin's Net, which is solely responsible for its content. Franklin's Net, training developers to work smarter. Rockheads, stop complaining about our temporary bandwidth shortage and listen up. It's time for another stellar episode of .NET Rocks, the internet audio talk show for .NET developers with Carl Franklin and Rory Blythe. This is Jeff Maciolik, here to announce show number 97 with Carl and Rory, recorded live Friday, January 21st, 2005. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net, training developers to work smarter, and now offering hands-on VBNet, ASPNet, and C-Sharp classes. Online at www.franklins.net. And by Data Dynamics, makers of ActiveReports.net. Simple, powerful, and cost-effective reporting for Windows Forms and ASPNet web applications. Online at www.datadynamics.com. Support is also provided by Code Magazine, Microsoft Technologies in-depth for IT managers and developers, online at www.code-magazine.com. And now, the man who bames the bandwidth crunch on me, Carl Franklin. It's all Jeff's fault. It's always my fault. <laughs> Actually, I should explain that. The bandwidth crunch is really only temporary. It's only for the next 10 days or so. So if you're listening to this, congratulations. I know it was a hard road to get here. Um, but uh, essentially, we've gone from a 15 megabit pipe that had been oversubscribed to about 30 megabits down to about 5 megabits for about 10 days while uh, we move some things around here. Um, we're just, uh, the ISP is, you know, uh, replacing some of the OC3 with some OC something else. And you know how that works. Just blocks of IP addresses have to move around. And then the people who are using those IP addresses get really mad and then they pull everything down and then everything crashes around you. It's just terrible. So, And uh, by the way, pardon me, I sound like um, uh, Minnesota me. Fats. <laughs> Actually. I sound like Rory has sounded over the last few weeks. And Rory is finally bouncing back to life here with a leap and a bound. And I'm going down that road right now. Thank you very much. How are you, Rory? I'm good. I'm really good. Not all screwed up like you. I'm good. Yeah. How does it feel for once? You and all your bandwidth on? problems and your lung problems? Actually, well, here's the deal, right? <laughs> there have been some comments in the chat room about how I finally decided to show up and, and, and stuff like that. And yeah. it turns out, uh, actually, we got an email a few days ago from somebody who wrote something along the lines of, Rory, are you sick again? And the deal <laughs> is, I wasn't actually sick again. It turns out after seeing the doctor that I've just been sick this whole time. Yeah. Since, since the end of November, I, I've had bronchitis. So I've had bronchitis for like two months and I just ignored it. And, and that was kind of dumb because... I had no energy. I didn't want to do anything. And I was constantly like lung barfing and it was disgusting. Ew. And I, yeah, I'd go out places with Erika and we'd be in a restaurant somewhere and I would cough and, and all the sputal discharge and yeah. many different colors would come up out of, out of my lungs and like shoot on things, land on the plate, Dude. stick to lamps and things like that. And it was really disgusting. This is the reason we went but, back to the old format right here. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but then they, they stuck Dude, me on all these drug. pills, um, something called Zithromax, some yeah. heavy duty antibiotic. antibiotic. And they put me through one course of that and it didn't kill everything. So they put me through another course and they gave me this weird adrenaline medication that got me all wired and freaked out. And, uh, and it was really uncomfortable and, and then all this other stuff happened and now my right lung hurts bad for some reason, but they said that that'll go away and, um, and, I, and I feel good. They also put me on codeine. That was awesome. That was like the best part <laughs> of getting sick is that they put me on this cough suppressant that was yeah. just like liquid codeine. Kinda so like I was totally trip. bonkers for an entire week. A little and journey through was, space and time, bliss. was it? We, I don't know if I'd call it space because I just <laughs> sat on my bed the whole time and stared, mm, but okay. um, definitely through time because that's sort of inevitable, Carl. I mean, whether I choose for it to happen or not, time seems to 
constantly move forward, sticking one foot, you know, in front of the other and advancing towards some <laughs> uh, unknown destination. So, yeah, there's not a whole lot I can do about that. But definitely a trip in space and time, as you put it. Actually, I guess even if I'm lying <laughs> on my bed, because the Earth is hurtling through space, um, I, I was actually moving. So, Ladies and gentlemen, what you're experiencing saying. right now is basically a month and a half worth of Rory that's been <laughs> bottled up and needs to come out all at once. Well, no, really, it, it felt like I was in a coma for two months. Yeah. I couldn't, I could not think straight, you know, I, I didn't want to do anything. Um, I wasn't paying any of my bills. The Oregon Department of Revenue actually had a warrant out for me. Um, there was a, th- there was a lot of stuff that I just didn't get done in that amount of time. And things didn't excite me because I had to put all of my energy into uh, ensuring that huge quantities of thick mucosal secretions were able oh, to be properly coughed up and, and rested from <laughs> my lungal innards. Um, but I did, I did manage to accomplish that task, and, and now I'm just feeling like a goddamn shining little gem. And, uh, you know, just like a, a newborn puppy. I don't, I don't know what it is. Yeah, I, f- I feel really good today. But, yeah, I'm like you. I mean, yeah. So, <clears throat> anyway, so, uh, so what's going on, Carl? <laughs> wow, how do I top that? I, I do want to also mention that the um, show that was advertised uh, sort of on the schedule for this week did not come to fruition because the guest had to uh, bail out at the last minute, unforeseenly. And so uh, sorry about that for those who were expecting it. But um, we have had this show sort of in our hip pocket for a long time, haven't we, Rory? And we've sort of just been waiting for an opportune moment to, to come out and use it. And essentially, you know, we've been constantly getting asked, you know, like in the chat room, Carl, when are you going to talk about multi-threading? Carl, when are you and Rory just going to talk about the stuff that you do? Yeah, Rory, uh, when are you going to talk about your lungal secretions? Lungal right. secretions, you know. So we are, this is actually not going to be just a fluffy show. We are going to get into some code and get us some topics and some things that have been, uh, you know, in the press recently and some other things. So it's going to be sort of uh, just a laid back with Carl and Rory kind of day. I like that, actually. We should do this more. Well, anyway. We have... Uh, Silence. F- yeah. <laughs> Insert crickets here. I like that. I think we should do this more. Nothing. Nothing. Silence. <laughs> no, it, 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 you know what? It actually will be fun. And I was thinking because you and I, uh, when, we li- when we have the guests on, one of the problems we both have is that we're so freaking excited about some of the things right. that we will just interrupt each other and right. the guest in order to say what our say is. So I think right. every once in a while we need to have these little sessions where it's just us kind of, you know, bleeding all of the, all this pressure that builds up, you know, over yeah. all these episodes. And sometimes I don't say anything on the show because I'm so scared that I'm just going to blurt out and start talking over somebody and giving a speech like now where I get up on my soapbox and I just can't shut the hell up, you know? So anyway, were you, were you saying something <laughs> interesting or well, at I, all? Go yeah, ahead, actually, say whatever you were saying. I was going to agree with you. And, and, you know, the problem is that and it's not a problem. It's basically the nature of the show. The nature of the show is that it's not about us. It's not about Rory and me. It's about the guest, and we try yeah, to... Yeah, that's taken a lot of getting used to, but yeah. you know, we've adjusted. <laughs> that's why we do Mondays, because that's all about us. But uh, but this is for you, and it's for you to, you know, to get inside the heads of uh, the people that are the guests. So anyway, before we start talking about uh, .NET and stuff, let's uh, listen to some email here. This one comes from somebody in Croatia whose name I'm not even going to try to pronounce, uh, but the initials are DK. Hello there, you big cuddly people, you. Don't mind my enthusiasm because I'm on vacation for the first time in a few years, so I'm I'm not all that accounted for. So I'm not all that accounted for. Anyways, I wanted to drop an email and say hi for a long time now, but never had found time or was just too lazy, I guess. So here it goes. I'm glad, as is 110% of your listeners who are too shy to drop you an email, that you exist and am for one of those who welcome recent change and big return of old format. Also, as early as I have discovered you, I think it was earlier than 10th show, I was trying to convince people of benefits regarding listening to DNR over some hip music on commute. How successful I was. Well, it remains to be seen, but you have at least one faithful listener and fan from Croatia. Maybe to help make my favorite show even better, okay, aside from Simpsons and Star Trek, uh, maybe suggestion or two. You have by now covered a lot of ground regarding .NET. Maybe it's time to get people from the field to talk about specifics regarding some technology. Let's say get Christian Wire to talk about web services for three or four episodes. Oh, man, I can't think of a more boring thing to do, talk about web (laughs) services for three or four episodes. But... um. I would like to get Christian Wire on, but we don't have to talk. Do we have to talk about web services for three or four episodes? I don't know as if our listeners could take that. 
And I don't think explaining at level 100, but more in-depth, hardcore stuff. For example, dedicate entire show for only one or two aspects of some technology. Let's say PPC, smartphone, web services, or such. Your show has been a great success in pointing us at the right direction. Maybe it's now time to get down and dirty. I mean, you sure had moments like it before, but usually, no pun intended, Carl or Rory were not able to follow where guest was going. There were moments when I was screaming questions I wanted answer only to realize that I was in middle of crowded bus. And Carl said, ahem, okay, hey, Rory, are you sick again? I know you can't be as proficient in every theme uh, that is covered in each show, but maybe to allow guests to pick its co-author, someone he, she works closely with, or is good in that field, and have these two persons cover theme in depth. Carl, Rory are only, you know, I just want to say at this point, uh, DK, uh, you should get your own show, really. I mean, clearly you've got ideas far and beyond what we want to do. And no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, that's about the gist of it. And he wants or she wants some uh, swag, which we will definitely send. Um, but basically, I wanted to say this. Yes, I think that we do exactly that. We, we are, I find the, the role of this show is not to uh, spell out line of code per line of code but to point people to things that they would not ordinarily be exposed to. And we have to make it entertaining, easy to listen to. And at the same time, we have to be informative and educational, but we don't want to lecture. I don't want to lecture. I don't think the fans want us to lecture. Do you, Rory? Uh, I don't care. Did you hear a word of that message at all? Or- <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> I, I read it earlier, too, so okay. I'm familiar with that. And I, I actually thought... All I really thought in the end was, wow, that's cool that there's somebody on Croatia, Croatia listening to us. Yeah. Um, I that's thought cool. that some of his suggestions were interesting, actually. The, yeah. the idea about doing a theme of show after show uh, on, the, on the same topic, I did like, but the problem is that we only do one show a week, right? right? So it would seem more monotonous than it sounds. Yeah. In my opinion. If we did a show like every day, then I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. But in doing you know, one show per week, especially if we have somebody who doesn't want to hear a thing about web services, then by the end of the month, they're going to be sick of it. Right. And, uh, and we might be too. So you never know. I think we've had that experience already. Haven't we? We did like three, so three shows in a row on web services and yeah, by and the end of it, kind of too much. And, and as Don XML, um, is pointing out in the chat room right now, 100 and 200 level talks equals mucho fans, 300 to 400 equals very few. And that makes a lot of sense, you know, cause mm. usually it's just a very small, uh, selection of people who can relate to to the really specific material anyway. Yeah. And it's better to do more of a, an overview and a survey rather than a real deep dive into code, especially yeah. for a show like this. Yeah, and so. I think audio doesn't lend itself well to talking about, you know, bits and bytes. <laughs> as we're going <laughs> to actually, so, yeah. but we're actually going to try that a little bit tonight um, because there are some things that uh, I'm going to explain code-wise that would really work with a video or at least a link to some source code or something, which we will put up, but... But as you can tell, I mean, once we start saying, you know, dim T as new thread paren address of, you know, um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That's when eyes are going to roll over and cars are going to drive off cliffs, you know, I think. So So anyway, but we do um, appreciate this person's suggestion. We didn't want to make it sound like we were getting down on them because check this out. This uh, uh, And he says or she says. And even if you don't change anything, I'll still be your great fan. My God, I'm sounding more and more like teenager writing a letter to some uh, pop star. Better to end here. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, DK, for that email. And uh, I, I do have another one here. This one is uh, from Sergio Pereira or something like that. Sorry, Sergio. Hi, Carl. Hi, Rory. Carl. I'd like to say first that your Visual Basic for Internet Programming book was what threw me into the TCPIP world of applications. Oh, cool. It helped a lot uh, to understand the underpinnings of that totally unusual programming environment, at least at that time it was unusual for me. Now I've built a career on top of that, and I have a lot of uh, to thank people that wrote books in VB, HDP, ASP, and .NET. I even remember frequently visiting the good old Carl and Gary website. But enough of my personal uninteresting history. What I'd like to do is suggest that you guys have somebody from the Microsoft MapPoint Web Services and Location Service as a guest on your show. I've started working with that technology in the last few months, and I can't say enough about how exciting it is. Everyone should check it out, msdn.microsoft.com slash MapPoint. It opens so many doors in your applications and for your company. I'd suggest bringing in Chandu Thota, Thota, 
or any other specialist. Well, just my little suggestion, take care. Sergio, Sergio, you are now the proud owner of a .NET Rocks mug. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Roy, um, you've been at the at the uh, the Big M for a little while. Have you uh, delved into MapPoint, at least for the purposes of demonstrating it? Yeah, actually, um, I have, I've, I've taken a look at it because I had to do a very short uh, set of presentations on it, about 20 minutes long. And uh, it is pretty exciting to me, mainly, though, from the web, web services perspective. Okay. Right? Because um, what blows me away, and what blew me away after giving that talk a few times and, and really thinking about it is, uh, well, for example, like this week, I bought, um, you know, the Scoble phone, the Audio Vox SMT 5600. You heard about these? Scoble phone? That's what they're calling because Scoble has been promoting these things like <laughs> he gave birth to them himself, you know, like they came uh, from his own cool. womb. Um, he's really, really excited about the phone. And uh, and there's a reason for it. It's that it's totally awesome. I used one that Jim Blizzard has. And then I went out to lunch with Chris Sells uh, last week and Chris just got one. So I was playing with his too. So what, what and, model um, is it? What model is it? It's an AudioVox SMT5600. They, they work for AT&T, but it's really easy to unlock the phone. Okay. Um, and so I've got mine running on, on T-Mobile service now. Okay. But, uh, but what's so incredible is that it's this little phone, right? But it has a .NET framework on it. Oh. And, and so I can, like through web services, for example, have all the power of MapPoint in this phone, which, is, which blows me just completely away. Because if you think about it, this would have been just impossible even a couple years ago right, to have that kind of power in such a small form factor. Because there's no space in the phone for that that you don't have the power for, for right. that in the phone. You know, you, you could not have a multipurpose device like this and still have the functionality of MapPoint. But I can hook in a MapPoint using the compact framework and, and web service calls and get just mucho functionality in this little tiny thing. And same goes for the eBay web service SDK and the Amazon SDK, which just really blows me away. So yeah, MapPoint, pretty cool. But I've been thinking about it more from the web service perspective than anything else. That's cool. I haven't. I don't have a smartphone. I have a dumb phone. Actually, it's just a, <laughs> you know, it's a you know Star Trek communicator style, Kyrosera uh, or whatever it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, LG phone. I think it is. But you know, it works, and that's the main uh, main thing that I like about it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm a, I'm going to get into the smartphone thing. I just you know I'm waiting really for something that's very cool to come out, and I haven't. No, seen this it is it. This you is so? this is probably the best uh, Windows-based mobile device that I've ever purchased, and I've really? been buying iPacs since the 3630, which was that very first iPack that came out um, around 2001, January 2001, and um, and I've just been buying the things ever since, and I've used quite a few different brands, different this, different that, and this thing just totally blows them all away. Um, wow! And I'm coming to it from an iPack 6315, which is one of the you know sort of top of the line pocket PC phones right now, and. There's not even any comparison. This thing is just, it's ridiculous. It has the okay. camera built in. Wow. Um, it has, uh, it's got a Bluetooth stack. Um, the GPRS connection is fantastic, so I can sync with my Exchange server. Nice. Um, well, with Microsoft Exchange server, just anywhere I am. It syncs with my Neapolitan account, wherever I am. It really? does everything. The thing, yeah, the thing is just ridiculously cool. Um, I awesome. can read. I can read the news on it. The, the browser is actually finally, um, it's HTML 4.01 comp compliant. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's actually XHTML wow. compliant. I'm pretty sure that it's uh, uh, JScript 5.1 compliant. So it's a full-blown browser now on this little thing. The Pocket P PC platform, I'm pretty sure, is still limited to HTML 3.0. I'm not entirely positive. But huh. but the advances they've made for the smartphone, uh, and especially with this model, are, are nuts. Um, and I've been using it for a few days without any kind of a problem, and it is totally lacking in any sort of like at least i haven't i haven't run into any bugs okay. you know, with the ipack 6315 i had to stop every once in a while and say hey you know i know we're having a great conversation here but huh. um can i call you right back i got to reboot my phone right? right right but with this thing it just works and it's awesome somebody in the chat room wants to know how it does on the 850 frequency what does that mean i i have no idea jeff what's the 850 frequency yeah jeff would know uh i have no idea somebody else asked if there's an rss reader but uh, read yeah there is feed reader actually. built in and i was gonna say oh, if there it, isn't it's, one it's you could, not built in yeah if there isn't one you could certainly if somebody could write it and you could run it because it's right well so, yeah and it'd be so easy i mean reading and parsing rss is is one of the easier xml tasks out there in the entire universe because yeah. rss is such a simple document format right. so it's really simple as a matter of fact <laughs> yeah. <laughs> shut it <laughs> but yeah um bastard cheeky bastard but um <laughs> But yeah, yeah writing an RSS American. reader for one of these things wouldn't be that bad. The hardest thing is that, uh, you know, you don't have as much screen real estate, mm -hmm. right? You, and you really have to keep that in mind. And you have a pretty limited 
subset of WinForm con- controls when you're when you're working with it. For example, there's no button control. Really? Well, no why would you need control. a button control? Well, on a phone. What do you say? On a phone, you really have the the buttons are hardware, so you just need to be able to read those buttons somehow. Well, kind of, but there are times when you want to be able to ask for somebody's confirmation. Um, like you want an OK oh, button, you okay. want the equivalent functionality. But what happens instead is uh, when you create menus on a form, they show up on the bottom of the screen and and they tie into what are called soft buttons. There's two buttons hmm. uh, just below the screen, one on the left and one on the right. Hmm. And uh, each one of those winds up getting assigned to one of the menus. And then, of course, each menu can either act simply as a button or you can stack up functionality inside of the menu. So it'll expand and you know, provide a whole list of options. Wow. And so yeah, has no, Chris, it, has, it's nuts. Yeah. has Chris written any software for it or, or has any of you guys written any software for it? I've been working on, um, some software for mine this week, actually. I, uh, cause I love the compact framework in general, I think as, as people might know by now, I've talked about it before, but yeah. How uh, did you describe it before? I think we should <laughs> say that again. <laughs> I called it a wrap around system that not implemented exception, but, yeah. um, that, that, <laughs> you know, that's just me being funny. You know, I, I really do love the compact framework coming from, uh, embedded visual basic, which was too weak and just right. a forms based memory leak. And then embedded visual C plus plus, which was a little bit too heavy duty for writing a really simple application. Right. The Donet compact framework is, is fabulous. And I really prefer it to, to J2ME as well. The, uh, the micro edition of, of Java. I never liked any of the Java handheld options. Um, so I love the compact framework. It is missing a lot of functionality and there are a lot of system not implemented exceptions, but Overall, it's a it's a fantastic you know. Speaking um, of speaking of the uh, compact framework, one of the things that I had to work around right off the bat when I started working with it was this no serializer. Like, there's no serialization stuff. There is actually the the at least in the version that I was looking at, I could almost swear that I was just looking at an article the other day for um, binary serialization, and I was actually I'm hoping it's this there because be I, I need it for an app. I'm this writing. must be two o because it's not in one point one or one point There is no hmm. binary formatter. Yeah. So the um, the 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 thing the reason I mention it is because um, uh, I you know I've been we've been sort of diving into BitTorrent a little bit here uh, yeah. for obvious reasons we need to you know uh, solve bandwidth problems and other things and uh, by the way podcasting plus BitTorrent equals bliss all right that's all I'm going to say about that um, yeah it looks like it saved our butt this week but yeah yeah it did. Uh, but one of the pro- things with BitTorrent is, and, and this is something I brought up on a blog and as I was learning about it, is that there's a, a, a serialization format that's very simple called B encoding. And mm-hmm. it's, it's simply like a, a running string kind of uh, serialization format for strings and integers and arrays and collections, mm-hmm. which is pretty much 99% of the stuff that you're going to be sending data-wise, right? You have numbers, you have... You have strings, you have arrays, you have collections. Yeah. And uh, so I wrote a little tool in VBNet to do the B in, B encoding. So essentially, you take a, you know, you take a class and uh, you create this little string from it. And it's basically a serialization engine that uses B encoding. Mm-hmm. And this is what BitTorrent uses in it. First, as I said, I thought it was this really strange binary format. I guess Jeff didn't really know what it was either, and he said it thought it was like this weird PHP binary sort of thing. And uh, upon further looking at it, it's just a very simple text-based uh, serializer. So so that would be a nice tool to use in the compact framework in lieu of having you know, full-blown binary formatter. You could at least uh, take some simple classes and that are marked serializable and uh, do something with them. Well, you know, there's actually um, a project called OpenNet uh, CF32. I think sure. that's what it's called. Yeah. And you're, you're familiar with that? Yeah. Yeah. And they, they've put together a simple um, serializer. It, would, it will only serialize properties. Oh, cool. Of your classes, but that's still better than nothing. And I'm pretty sure that's OpenNetCF32.org or OpenNetCF.org. I forget what it actually is, but um, you can yeah, do a search on that. And properties are we'll essentially come across most, something. Of, most of what you're going to use anyway. Yeah. But I wanted to mention something here. Um, MJT in the chat room says, isn't the compact framework light on XML support? And uh, I figured mm-hmm. this is something that some people might want to know about. And the answer is, um, yes, it is actually pretty light on XML support. At least when I reason, was though. last using it on the Pocket PC, you'll find yourself using um, XML text writers and text readers pretty often. Um, you can still use uh, the Adionet data set um, if you want to for, uh, for building structures and, and, and saving them to XML. Mm-hmm. Um, but... I think, and I might be making this up, but I, I'm pretty sure that I remember hearing that performance 
on yes. that wasn't everything that it could be as you know you might imagine. Yeah, XML so. XML and Pocket PCs uh, equals weight basically. Yeah, they, yeah. but you, you have to do it actually on on the phone edition because um, the the smartphone operating system does not support uh, ADOCE, so mm. you can't you can't use ADOCE even through interrupt, and there is no SQL Server CE huh. on on the smartphone. So if you want to do any sort of structured data storage, you're going to be limited pretty much to XML, mm. um, unless mm. you've got some other proprietary solution. But I think a lot of us will wind up using XML. And the apps that I've written for the, in the past for the Pocket PC have done things in XML. But here's something to think about, though. If, when, when you're talking about a phone, you can pretty much assume connectivity all the time, right? And, right. Uh, and what you could potentially do... Um, is simply use some sort of remote storage system and just store everything through web services. So you don't even have to worry about how it's, how it's being kept on the phone. Just simply push everything off to some server someplace else. Well, I mean, that's, yeah. That's, that's one idea. That's one idea. That could end up taking a lot longer too, depending on your structures. It, but it, it could, yeah. And I totally agree with you. And, uh, and, and that would kind of stink. And especially since, you know, like my GPRS connection, it's basically like dial-up. You know, so it, it could take a minute, but you could come up. I mean, when, when you're dealing, dealing with compact framework development, you're always going to have to work um, a little bit harder to get the same to get the same thing done that you do on the desktop. And you have to make certain compromises to say, you know, your preferences about how to do things. And rather than, you know, committing changes in a fashion that you might be used to, it might be a good idea to take a look at like, it, you know, storing accumulative changes or storing cumulative changes and then persisting them yeah. uh, once you hit some sort of a crucial point. Sure. You know, that's, that's one way of thinking about it. Hey, uh, yeah, can, I, can I change uh, gears here for a minute? Well, Go sure. to okay. uh, shrinkster.com slash 3DM. That's okay. 3DM. By the way, if you go to shrinkster.com now, we've been using them so much that they actually put up little Mondays and .NET Rocks ad on Shrinkster. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. Huh. That's awesome. They're even kinda there neat. for the redirect. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, for the redirect. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you, guys. That's kind of nice. Um, and I think that Ooh. was Rory that Ooh, discovered. much better in theory than in practice. Yeah, this is going to get you going here. Just uh, <laughs> What I want you to do, Ooh. actually, Rory, is take a minute and just read through this article. And uh, we'll be right back with uh, everybody right after we do this. Okay, so I'll, I'll read this. Folks, do yourself a favor and check out our friends Data Dynamics website, datadynamics.com, makers of ActiveReports.net. Simple, powerful, and cost-effective reporting for uh, Windows Forms and ASP.NET. Very nice stuff. You can pile the uh, the reports right into your application, ship them with your assemblies. Uh, has all the great features you come to expect in a reporting engine, and you can use uh, ActiveX controls right in the reports too. So, great stuff. Uh, Data Dynamics has been an excellent sponsor of .NET Rocks uh, for a long time. They, uh, you know, they deserve a little bit of uh, your love and attention. So, go check them out at www.datadynamics.com. So what do you think of that, Rory? Okay. Um, <sighs> let's see. Now I got into some trouble when um, I put up that Dvorak post and I used all that strong language. So I'm yeah, you're gonna to have to take a deep breath before you answer this. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to stay away from that. Um, <sighs> this just okay. M- my initial impression is that this totally reeks of that guy who works in the corporate environment, who's in the corner, who has 20 years of RPG and COBOL cold. Uh, code under his wing and he doesn't want to give up any power and he hates all the people who are coming in who learn new things and and who keep progressing their skills and do a better job of putting together applications that make him feel inferior because he hasn't been doing the same thing right there's always this sort of 
stigma. I mean, you, you meet these people at just about every business. They get really pissed off whenever anybody wants to use something that was invented, say, in the past decade, right? And, and this guy <laughs> is, is totally, totally one of those. Um, I think that one of my, one of my favorite uh, deals here is that he's talking about... Um, <laughs> he's, I, I, he's, he's like talking about how it's basically a rumor that object orientation oh and first of all for everybody who hasn't read this yet the title is oop is much better in theory than in practice this guy goes through in three pages and um very weakly and feebly uh spills his dribbly spittle all over uh i his, like the his, suggestion his understanding that, of object oriented programming i like the but wait, suggestion no, that you could, don't wait, even wait. try to talk yet man because i gotta <laughs> i gotta get this out of my system here this this guy, okay, he's talking about how object-oriented programming is basically rumored to be good for reuse, right? He's talking about oh, this is a common argument that the, the OOP camp likes to put forward. And he Just says, use cut and paste. you know, following yeah. that, that anything you can do with reuse, you can do with copy and paste. Copy okay, and fine. Paste. You know what? In theory, like to a certain extent, that's, that's right in some weird, strange uh, uh, part of the universe that I don't understand. But... But he then goes on to talk about how object-oriented programming leads to code bloat, right? Mm. So if mm. I write, you know, say an 800-line class and I inherit all that functionality um, um, into another class and I start, you know, building that second class uh, uh, from the first one and I wind up with, say, like, you know, two different classes and what would originally have been, say, 1,600 lines of code and maybe 1,200 lines of code, then I don't see how that's code bloat. Yeah. But if I were going to copy and paste all this crap, you know, between all these different <laughs> files, what am I going to have? I'm going to have a directory that's going to be jam-packed full of all these different little tiny incremental differences. Wouldn't it be great if the help things? file for .NET was, you know, instead of inherit this class, it's like, okay, go to the source code and copy and paste <laughs> these lines of code into your I lo- application. I love that. Mark yeah. Dunn's clipboard inheritance. You know, that clipboard was one of his, that was one of Mark's um, you know, moments Brilliant. of genius. I, I love that. I've never forgotten that. And that's yeah. exactly what this guy is talking about here, right. clipboard inheritance. And, and the idea just really blows me away. I mean, what's going to happen when you want to have like that base employee structure? And then on top of the employee, you want to build the idea of like, you know, a, a systems administrator or a developer <laughs> yeah, or a CTO or whatever security, for yeah. use in some internal HR system, right? What are you going to do? Like build 500 different structures or just mm. build that one abstract base class right. and then, you know, inherit and implement the added functionality for each yeah, of those. And it's, the help file again is going to say, okay, when you use this function, don't forget to call this function, then call that function and then call this function, which is in this include file and that function. <laughs> we had that. It was called the Windows API. And I don't know if you've used <laughs> any programs <laughs> that have been uh, developed using that method, but they kind of suck. You know, they they're right. they're they're uh, basically uh, big GDI uh, errors waiting to happen here. You know, and, we have and, and, memory leaks, and yeah. it's just the beginning of it. I mean. And what, what about polymorphism, what is, right? So yeah. you do come up with all your different structures that are built around um, the, the idea of the employee and the HR worker and this and that and this and that. But because they have absolutely no common base type, you know, you're going to have to treat each one differently and in different cases and different scenarios. You're going to have one of those wonderful APIs that, you know, has methods like do something with um, secretary, do something with, you know, HR employee, do something with customer, do something <laughs> with employee, right? Instead of being able to accept just the abstract base class as the type. And then, and then operate on it and do any casting when it's necessary. I can't believe that. I hate this kind of crap. This, yeah, this stuff really pisses me off. It's really unbelievable. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I've worked in these situations and I've, and I've worked with these people. And, and the funny thing is there's this strange set of double standards, which I can relate to because I actually live my life by double standards and sometimes like triple <laughs> standards. I mean, I'm really bad about it, you know, but, but um, I don't like when other people do it. And that's one of my double standards. And this guy here uh, is going through and, and just talking so much smack about he's, he's implying that like the oop camp has sort of uh, an arrogance problem or like a nose up in the air problem. <laughs> well, his and, big, and his big he's argument, basically I think, doing the same thing. He's looking yeah. down his nose at all of us and talking about what a bunch of idiots, he, idiots his big, we are. His basic argument is that people make excuses for why they don't ship software on time and why you know that it doesn't work for this reason and for that reason. He thinks the Oop Camp is full of excuses. I, I totally don't see that. I, uh, I see a productivity. I see products that are being shipped. I see products that are working, that are more stable, that are not bloated. The actual uh, ship of the code that you actually ship is like a, a zillionth of the size of the code that you would ship otherwise if you were writing all that code yourself or copying and pasting, as this guy suggests that we do. And uh, I, I think the guy is smoking crack, basically. <laughs> smoking crack. I feel crack. bad, too, because his picture's up there and he just looks so happy. You know? Yeah. 
And, wow. and, and I hate talking the smack about it, but this should just not even have been posted. Actually, I guess it's all right that it was posted because it gave us all something to argue about. Yeah, I guess so. Um, and these people really are out there, which, which is incredible. But, uh, but yeah, the, the article itself is just, is just total, utter filth. Yeah. I've see, been... there, was actually, there was actually some other stuff in here that had me um, very lightly you know, fro- frothing at the mouth here. Um, and I'm trying to take a look at it. Let's see, where are we going? Yeah, he says that uh, one of the arguments as well that the UP camp puts forward um, when faced with uh, questions and accusations by the procedural camp is that the UP guys say, um, and gals say, you don't understand UP and that's why you're uh, having problems with it. You know? And he's saying this as though it weren't true. But I think in a lot of cases where people have problems with object-oriented programming, it is because they don't really get it. You know, like I've seen managers work with VB and, and build one form mm. and have 6,000 lines inside of one method, inside right. of one form, and that's their entire application. Right. And they figured out enough code to somehow repaint the form with different controls and handle different scenarios with really complicated uh, if blocks and select case uh, blocks, but... Yeah, they, they clearly don't know what they're doing. And, and in a case like that, I think it's a perfectly valid thing to say, yeah, you don't have a clue as to what you're doing. The right. reason OOP sucks for you is that you don't know a damn thing about OOP. And, right. and that's really more common, I think, than And that's than not an excuse. Know. That's not an excuse. That's learning your tools. Right, exactly. It doesn't matter what yeah. tools you use. You have to learn how to use them in order to use them effectively. Yeah. You know, that's not an excuse. Come on. Drives me insane. Anyway, so so that was that was enough anger. Did you did you want to get some anger out? Did you want? Some uh, no, I think you pretty much. Uh, I live vicariously through you on this one. I you know. <laughs> okay, all right. So anyway, you know, getting the hell away from uh, this stupid, crazy crack code. Um, what have you been working on lately that you wanted to talk about? Which oh doing? man, I I really have. Uh, I well, first of all, I've, I'm writing an application. You know that we're using at Plot Productions to uh, handle remote uh, attendees of talk shows. And uh, essentially, we are. Uh, this is probably the best time, uh, as good a time as any, to announce this. But um, uh, and it's not an announcement; it's just sort of a heads up that there is another show coming out of Pop Productions, and mm. it's going to be a .NET Rock style show uh, on that other language that starts with a J and ends with Ava. And uh, we're not, of course, m- me personally, I'm not involved in the content in any way. But Pop is, you know, does have a couple of people in that community, so one of whom you probably know, and uh, they are uh, getting the sponsorship together to do a weekly show, .NET Rock style on Java. And so, is it? Uh, can can I ask about like specifics, or is this still supposed to be really no, secret? Well, it's not really secret. It just hasn't gelled yet, so I don't want to give away too much. So, oh, okay. just just right. we'll we'll just wait and see what happens. But I think it's going to be good can, for those. Can you just tell me tell me this much? Um, is there a ponytail involved? I'm not saying. Okay. But I, I, I am saying that, you know, Paul Revere would be proud. So maybe. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, that, yeah. that was cryptic enough. Yeah. Okay. I buy that. All right. Maybe Thomas Jefferson. But I'm not telling you anything about other, that, other than that. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is an application that we're, set, we're sort of getting a kit together with a laptop and a microphone and an application that, where we can remotely control users' um, uh, microphone settings and, and mixer settings to choose the right input and have the right volumes and we can do all that remotely and we can we can tell them to start recording to an mp3 file on their side and actually monitor it on our side at the same time and then we can reach down and tell them to uh, upload their files via M- FTP and monitor that and so it's sort of a hands-off for the user and we get to control what they're doing remotely, and we get a good good file out of it. So um, the thing came down to, okay, now we have to go out and do an auto-updating kind of you know, auto-deployment solution. We need some sort of auto-deployment solution. So we couldn't use the simple hrefxe stuff because... Uh, there was, you know, there's XML files for uh, private public key pairs for security. We're doing cryptography. Um, there's uh, config files. There's other XML files. There's, you know, like a bitmap. So there's resources and things too that aren't compiled into the into the assemblies. And uh, that just doesn't work with hrefxe. So then I looked at using Netrun, Rocky Latka's uh, thing, and that seemed a little bit overly complex to me. Um, which I have told people about in the past, and I guess I hadn't looked at it in a while, but he's got stuff in there to elevate security and 
uh, and uh, just couldn't get that going. And besides, he's he has this thing where you just pass like the URL and the command line, and I sort of didn't want an open solution like that. I wanted something right. where I wanted something where you you know the URLs and the executables and the paths are hard coded into the application, the launcher, because that's I'm writing this launcher for this one application. I don't need to reuse it. If I need to reuse it, I'll build another application. I'll put the URLs in there. And there you go. <laughs> and um, so so essentially what I do is I put the whole application on the server in a zip file. And then I have this launcher go out and look for that zip file and, you know, test the uh, last access time on that zip file, last, you know, last touch time, I guess it was, the creation time, that, you know, on it. And if it's different than what we have, it downloads it and extracts it using a free IC Sharp Zip Lib. You know that one? Yeah. Sharp Zip Lib? Which is basically a port of the Java zip code that's been around forever, and it's solid, and it's free, and it works great. That stuff will be built into the framework version too, by the way. Is it really? Compression. Well, there's going to be the system.io.compression stream. Oh, great. I well, don't know if that's exactly what it's called, but yeah, there will be compressions <laughs> built in. But anyway, go on. Excellent. Well, um, so it works right. And, and it's basically, you just run this launcher, which you know is minimized, not minimized, but it's hidden and it doesn't run anything. And basically, if, uh, if you're offline, it asks you if you want to use the, the stuff that you already have. Great. If you're not offline and it needs to update, it asks you whether you want to exit or, you know, wait, or if you can't get this, you know, so it handles like all the different scenarios. It'd be offline or online and, uh, and it, and it just works and it's simple. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, is it, is there something wrong with this architecture that doesn't exist and somebody hasn't figured this out? Uh, or is it me? Uh, I don't think I'm the most brilliant programmer in the world, but it didn't take me long to figure this out. Um, so I don't know. What do you think? Hmm. Well, um, I do know that like out in the chat room, Sahil M is screaming click once. Yeah, but we don't have click once here. I don't have right. this today. So I, I have to improvise. So yeah. And click once doesn't work with 1.1. That's what I'm using now. So, right. and besides that, it doesn't exist. So at this time of this taping. So, so essentially it's, it's a, you know, the same kind of thing, except Click once is even more complex than this, um, but you know it does significantly more in terms of security and configuration mm-hmm. and things like that. But, uh, but oh, that's uh, cool. I'd actually like to be let in on on some more of the details. I mean, I had no idea that there was all this pop stuff going on behind my back. You know? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, you've been I'm out doing of things it, you don't know about too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you've been out of it. You've been sick. So yeah, I know. I haven't been doing anything. I've been, I've been playing Xbox. I, I've been not doing anything. Cool. Well, um, one of the things that's cool about this, and, and I'm just going to, I have the code right here, actually, and I'm looking at it, is that the, the way in which it downloads the zip file, uh, it uses a, um, an HTTP request, HTTP mm-hmm. web request, and, uh, and then just you know, gets a response from that, and then I can check the last modified property of the response object, which yeah. I think is just brilliant. I mean... I was I was showing this to Jeff, right? And I got to that line of code, and he says, yeah, you got the response, but how are you going to find the last modified time of that? <laughs> and I said, ah, well, check this out. There happens to be a last modified property. It's That's like, awesome. holy shit. I didn't know that you could do that. It's just like all these little surprises. Oh, and by the way, I did not have to write that last modified code, or I did not have to copy and paste it. It's just there, okay, Mr. Copy and Paste inheritance well no that's because the guys who wrote the framework did all the copying and paste yeah yeah that's right yeah so you wouldn't have to do it right so then i'm i'm using essentially when i get the stream off of that uh the input stream off of that response i'm doing um uh asynchronous begin reads and end reads i'm doing asynchronous reads on the data because i found that if i just said you know read and waited for all of the data i wasn't getting all of the data and so there, there are situations where, and I think it may be the limited bandwidth situation that my server is in, but if, you know, if this is going to be a real world situation out there that uh, you have to deal with it. So instead of just, you know, doing a read, I'm doing begin read and I'm reading basically 8K at a time. Hmm. And uh, uh, if, I, if I get a full buffer, great. I just keep reading again. If I get uh, not a full buffer, I just keep reading again. If I get zero back from end read, 
uh, you know, in the uh, in the callback, then I'm done. Then I close it, and it works great, man. I, yeah, and I, 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 out in the chat room, MGT, MG, MJT, sorry, I couldn't say it, is saying, Carl, I watched an MSDN TV episode with Tim Huckabee, and there's supposedly an application updater service that does the same thing you did, and it works pretty well. Um, yeah, but I didn't write it, so... <clears throat> I was going to say, that's one of the things that, that I know about you is that you love writing network code. So I love it. Yeah. It's yeah. fun. So even though there is going to be something out there that you could have just plugged into your, into your uh, application, Actually, I have seen this man, everybody, at you know, 2, 3, 4, and 5 o'clock in the morning um, just with a big smile on his face uh, coding out his network yeah. code. So It, all, it really yeah. only took me a couple hours. It wasn't, wasn't long Yeah, but all. you were always doing something. I remember when I was living in your office and I'd wake up at 5 sure. o'clock in the morning and you'd still be there coding, typing. Right. You know? It, it, it's pretty incredible. Anyway, I'm sorry. Well, anyway, the, uh, ap- the application updater, there's two of them. One of them works and one of them uh, doesn't. And I'm, I was never sure of which one to use. And they, both of those seem to have their issues. I remember talking with Brian uh, Noyes about them. And, uh, and just things that you have to work around. And I'm, you know, I, I really find that these tools that I'm using here are not low level tools. I mean, I'm not writing bit twiddling code here. You know, this is a, this is a significantly high level thing, this HTTP web request and web response and, uh, the asynchronous, uh, model with the, uh, streams for reading and writing data. This is fairly high level stuff. You know, I don't think that it has to be, you know, uh, in a DLL that you just download and make a single call and then configure with a config file in order for it to be valid. I, you know, if you, you know, if you can do it, why not do it? So I, I just, just tells me it, uh, it really says a lot about the framework and the power of it, you know, mm-hmm. that you can do this. I would never be able to do this with VB6, for example. Never. Very cool. Well, sweet. So that just sort of put a damper on the show, didn't it? <laughs> not, not so much a damper. Um, I think uh, <laughs> we were all just basically listening to how you did it. Um, oh, cool. So um, what other kind of stuff have you been uh, working on lately, Roy? And what's been, what's been tickling your fancy out there well, in the community? As you probably figured out from my whole rant at the beginning of the show, I've been, I've been doing Compact Framework stuff. And uh, I'm currently writing um, a, uh, this is the, this is by far, like by a very wide, wide, wide margin, the the dorkiest, geekiest thing I think I've ever done. And I'm writing a generic role-playing engine um, that I'll be able to use uh, for my phone. Because I'm looking at my phone and I'm thinking, it sure would be, I mean, I've got all these games in my head that I really want to write and that I would like to have. um, But the problem is... Uh, a lot of people don't like text-based games, right? And mine would have a mostly text interface. I just want to say, Rory, yeah. if you wrote a text-based game, I think I would play it constantly. You, I bet you could write the best text-based Yeah, well, what I've got up in my head for this one is pretty disgusting and sick. Um, Great. <laughs> so, and, and I actually have about four other really disgusting and sick ideas up there alongside it. And that's why I want a generic engine, so that I can come up with one you know, game engine and then just change all of the uh, content files to support the new sick idea, right? And eventually make it multiplayer. But I want to start out and write like a single player system that'll be based on what's called GURPS. I just found out about this a couple of days ago when I was <laughs> looking at a game, uh, role-playing game theory. And uh, I have I a lot of GURPS like, books, Rory. I'm you have GURPS, GURPS books? Yeah, I have a lot of GURPS books. What does it stand for, Jeff? Is it Generic Universal Role-Playing System? Is that yes, what it is? It's Generic Universal Role-Playing System. I have GURPS Traveler, which is cool. It's a port of the Traveler Role-Playing System to GURPS, which is yeah, like... Yeah, okay, this isn't a GURPS show, though, so shut up. So oh, I've, oh. I've got this GURPS <laughs> thing, and, uh, and, and I've been kind of implementing it in code. It's, it's like 20 pages. The, the, the game system itself basically has a spec. And um, I've, been, I've been sketching it out uh, both on my tablet and on this stuff called paper, actually using, using this thing <laughs> called a pen, where when you press down on the paper, um, the stuff comes out of it and stays on the paper. And it's random uh, access, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and so I've been sketching this thing out, and it's just been like a real pleasure to get back into designing something kind of big again. Because this is not going to be a really small project, and I've been trying to decide between doing the full-blown version the first time or doing a small trial to see what kind of problems I'm going to run into. But, you know, I'm one of these people who's really impatient and I'm probably just going to design it all on paper and code it and hope that it all works. But I want it to be generic enough that I'll be able to swap out all the content and and just move a whole new story in there. And I'm going to write a partial uh, game generator for it as well so that I don't have to sit there and write all the maps by hand. But it's going to be pretty cool. And a text, huh. a text game, although it will not fly on a uh, on a PC anymore for the most part, 
Um, I mean, they will, but you're not going to get that much of an audience, I think would do quite well on a phone, you know, because you're dealing with limited real estate. And even if you do have graphics, I mean, the sprites on the screen, which are the little individual characters you move around are going to be what, like four pixels by four pixels, you know, it's going to be like playing the Atari again, right? So it it doesn't look so hot. So doing a text interface. Um, it's actually a pretty cool thing. And, and in doing this, uh, I'm learning a lot about the limitations of coding for the smartphone and uh, a lot about what, what the compact framework can actually do with the smartphone. And it's fun because, you know, I, I felt like I'd already kind of gone through the pocket PC uh, uh, compact framework development world and, and encountered a lot of challenges and seen yeah. what you could do to, to overcome these obstacles. So it's exciting, again, to come to another device where I have to learn about new obstacles and, and be presented with new challenges. Should do it's a, even more fun because it's even more restricted than yeah. the pocket PC. So you really have to think when you're putting this stuff together. And, and I don't know why, but I find that very satisfying. You should do a, uh, a web service interface for the uh, games, the text games. I was I was thinking about it, you know, I, I was trying to figure out how I wanted to do the storage, right? Um, because ideally, I wanted to have, uh, like the way I was thinking about doing this is I wanted to have a game world object, which would keep track of like what room the player is currently in, all the player's current stats, where all the various items are in the game and where all the enemies are. And right. in order to save the game, in order to save it at any particular point, you know, like if you want to turn the game off or something like that, I would just simply serialize the game world. Yeah. See, it's a very easy, easy, easy thing, you know, to do on the desktop. Um, and now I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do that uh, with the uh, compact framework. But I'm thinking that I could potentially set up a centralized server somewhere where all of your game settings could be stored. And the only time you would have to retrieve and send would be at the beginning of your session, at the end of the session. So hmm. it might not be that bad. But, I mean, if we're talking about a large enough game world, I don't want people to have to be, you know, transmitting like 300K over a GPRS data line, especially if yeah. they're getting charged um, by, you know, like... For, for bandwidth, for example, I'm not, so it's not a big deal, but some people are. So it's great. You get to, you get to figure out, um, how to deal with these challenges. And you also get to come, come at these things in a totally new way. I mean, dealing with the phone, it really is an option to assume connectivity, you know, and, and, and being able to write the application, knowing that you can just connect out to a server and really take advantage of web services is, is pretty exciting, you know, so. Pretty sweet. I just love the idea of putting a lot of functionality in one of these little phones and storing a lot of the data and a lot of the processing power yeah. on some remote server somewhere. That's yeah. cool. And then eventually I'd like to make this sucker multiplayer. So you'll be walking through this game world. And I'm not going to give you any details because um, that would give away a lot of what makes the game special. But I will say it would be cool if you could go through this game world and encounter other people, right? And interact yeah. with them in some way. Not a real meaningful way, but a superficial way where one of you dies in the end. You know, things like that. <laughs> and... Uh, and I can when you die, just imagine gerp. people standing in line at movie theaters, you know, playing this little game on their phone, sitting in the coffee shop, up on the plane and things like that. You know, I think it'd be pretty cool. It would be cool. And if it was a text-based adventure game written by you, again, I would think that it would be very, very popular. Hey, Rory, um, on the yeah. subject of low bandwidth, um, semi-text-based adventure games, have you heard of or played Kingdom of Loathing? No. Oh, wait a minute. Are you talking about the one that has all the stick figures? Yes. Yeah, I... I <laughs> Somebody actually pointed me to that um, because she was reminded of my uh, artwork. Um, uh, and I went and I took a look at it and it, it was cool, but I, I, I didn't really get into it that much. Yeah, it's, it's, well, I think it's great because, uh, well, there, there are references to a lot of things. Well, Carl actually saw one. There's a reference to a band called Negative Land. When you buy <laughs> yeah, 11 right. items of anything in the game, um, <laughs> it'll say, you, you know, you purchased 11 of whatever. And then it says, that's ridiculous. It's not even funny. Which that's is a reference a, to one of their It's songs. a reference to a Negative Spinal Land song. Or, oh, okay. no, negative <laughs> Land. Negative yeah. Land. Negative well, land. you know, this isn't a show on gaming. No, no, although, no. I just wanted to mention that. Uh, it is really cool, though. Um, but yeah. I wanted to shift focus, if I can, to... This book that got dropped in my lap. And by the way, if any authors and our publishers out there wondering why I'm not uh, talking about their books, it's because I don't have them. So if you want me to talk about them, send them to me or send them to Rory. Um, we do get a steady stream of books by uh, uh, Addison Wesley. And now they're sending us the Microsoft.net development series. And this book that just landed is a, from a friend of mine, um, Dr. Neil Rudin. And I don't know if you know who he is, but uh, Dr. Neil, as he's called, wrote a really good uh, intro to programming the tablet PC. Uh, that's a free uh, ebook, and uh, I met him at the tablet PC uh, camp out there in Redmond last year. Uh, forwarded by Paul Yao, it's called Extreme .net, Introducing Extreme Programming Techniques to .net Developers. 
And um, it's uh, John Montgomery and Don Box said good things about it on the back cover. George Bullock wrote a little clip, uh, uh, a little uh, testimonial. And I've been going through it. And let me just say that this guy is brilliant. He's smart and he's methodical and he's funny and he's common sense. He's all common sense. A lot of this stuff in that he's talking about in extreme programming is common sense. And he's not like an extreme programming zealot, you know, somebody who's going to say all of these things will work for everybody. I mean, he even says at the outset that this isn't going to work for everybody, mm-hmm. uh, especially pair programming. But, but, you know, there's a great chapter called How to Solve Big Problems, Chapter 3, which is essentially how to take big, overwhelming problems – and break them down into units that you can do in you know four hours or less. And if it's going to take more than four hours, break it down again. And so that you, f- you find yourself doing finishing something in you know, the course of a day instead of you know, trying to come back into it the next day where you're you know, three quarters of the way through and, and wondering what the hell you're doing. But he's got these personas that uh, go through uh, and, and discuss these problems you know, in a conversation throughout the whole book. And I just find it really fascinating, and it makes me, as I read this, it makes me want to get a group of people together to, uh, you know, to to learn the XP stuff and to actually do a project just for the experience of doing it because it looks really fun, hmm. really fun. So there's the 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 book is Extreme dot net introducing extreme programming techniques to .net developers Addison Wesley. Uh, Dr. Neil Rudin, and you know, affectionately known as Dr. Neil, not like uh, that Oprah guy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm enjoying this book, and thanks for sending it to me. Uh, cool. And, and and not to uh, not to drag anything back to where we were or anything. Um, but I just want to say one last thing about smartphone. Um, for anybody who's interested, there is a post over at Nauman uh, Ligari's blog. And that's at shrinkster.com slash 3DO. That's the letter O. So shrinkster.com slash 3DO. And it's a whole list of um, smartphone uh, development resources. It's just a whole list. He put together what he thought were the best of articles out there. And it's a great place to start if you want to learn about coding for the smartphone. And if you happen to have Visual Studio.net 2003, um, you can download the smart, Smartphone 2003 SDK, which comes with a smartphone uh, emulator. So you don't even need one of these phones to start programming for me to learn about them. Very cool. So, just wanted to get that out. Um, but I do want to make this other announcement to all the people who are downloading with a podcasting client. You will not be able to get podcast feeds to MP3s and or WMAs anymore. We're starting this next week with the 100th show. You will have to uh, subscribe to a new feed that uh, is going to use a torrent. So it's going to use BitTorrent. Now, we have a couple of movies that we've done, or one of them at least that we've done, in how to set up Azurius, which is a pod, uh, uh, sorry, a BitTorrent client. Jeff and I actually did. It's at pwop.com. If you look at uh, pwop video, you'll see it there. And uh, it's a full screen Camtasia video where we actually installed from scratch and configured the Azurius client to use our uh, torrent feeds. So uh, it's got a built in RSS reader. Essentially, you just run this thing. You put in the uh, link to our uh, podcast feed for the torrent files, and then it essentially does the same thing that your iPodder does, except that it's going to download a torrent file and kick off a BitTorrent session. What's great about that, of course, is that when they all happen at the same time, uh, you know, people get the benefit of sharing each other's uh, data. And so it's actually going to bandwidth, high bandwidth or no high bandwidth, you're going to get your file a lot faster. And uh, that's what matters. So we're sort of upgrading the podcasting here. And I wanted to make this announcement this week so you're not surprised next week. And with that, I think uh, I think it's time to wrap it up. What do you think? I think that, yeah, it's time to wrap it up. This was a very satisfying show, finally getting to, you know, let out some of all that stuff that, you know, we don't really talk about too much, you know, yeah. like what we're into. So I, th- I thought it was fun. I'm glad you're feeling better, my friend. And I'm looking oh, forward to next you. week. I'm glad you took my place as the sick one. <laughs> we'll see what happens next week. Well, on uh, behalf of me and Rory and Jeff in the sound room, everybody out there in the chat room, I'd like to thank you for listening and rock on, and we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>